you all, you all set? Yes. All right. Thank you. Uh, so um, good, good late morning, everybody. Um, the topic of our panel today is the future of work. I think on anybody's list of important topics related to the digital economy, this is certainly um, one of them. Um, I've had my say this morning, for better or worse. And uh, so let me introduce the panelists, and, and we'll get right on with it. I'm delighted to be here, not only with very distinguished and accomplished uh, uh, people, but, but also old friends. So on my immediate left is Sam Palmazano. He is the founder and, and, uh, and leader of, the, of, a, of a nonprofit um, called the Center for Global Enterprise, at, at which I have privilege of having some involvement with. Um, and he is the former chairman of IBM. Uh, Victor Fung, this is a panel that doesn't need any introductions, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Victor Fung is the chairman of the, the Fung Group, of course, uh, the founder of uh, what is now AGI, um, and uh, a, a leading a leader in, in global business, the International Chamber of Commerce, and a list of things that uh, would take the rest of the panel to document. And my good friend Rob Johnson is, uh, is the um, Chief Executive of, uh, I don't know what the formal title is, President? President of the uh, Institute for New Economic Thinking, formed in the immediate aftermath of the crisis, um, to try to uh, break down the barriers of, of conventionality in, in the analysis of our economy, our financial system, and, and things that are, go well beyond that. And Rob has an extraordinary career. He's a sailor. He's been a senior staff member in Congress. He knows how our political system works, you know, inside out. Um, he has been an investor um, in the complicated world of hedge funds. He's, uh, every time I turn around, and he's a musician. His dad was a musician. He grew up in Detroit, which is now coming back. It, every time I turn around, he teaches me something else about the world we live in. So I'm thrilled to have these. Uh, three colleagues here to talk, and we're going to go in the order that we're sitting. Uh, and so, Sam, let me turn it over to you to kick off the discussion. Well, Michael, thank you, and Victor, thank you for having me back. This is my second time in Hong Kong this year, uh, and it's always special for me to return because I lived in Tokyo for several years with my family, and whenever we got tired of uh, the concrete and the asphalt, we come here for a great respite. So, Victor, I always love coming back and visiting my old friends. That's when we got to know each other. And that was like over, I guess it's over 30 years ago now, but it's been a wonderful experience. And we do, we do love Asia um, and love coming back, my entire family. Uh, the topic of work in the future is kind of a, a, it's a phenomenally complicated, but I think it also a misunderstood story. I won't repeat what Michael talked about as far as technology is concerned, except it's only accelerating. So for those of you in the audience who long for the old days and where it was slower and you, know, you had these clunky terminals attached to mainframes and all those sorts of things, well, that's never coming back. In fact, it's only, it's only speeding up. And so therefore, the implications of this technology uh, are dramatic. Now, when it comes to the work itself, it's interesting because I don't know if you've read a lot of economics, e economist reports or the McKinsey studies that basically paint a picture that because of artificial intelligence or machine learning and those sorts of things, that all jobs will be eliminated. In fact, we will have a wonderful society, we'll all have a stipend and we can live and write poetry or do music because everything else is gonna be done for us. Um, I think that's an overstatement. Uh, I've been around technology for a long time, I mean 50 years or so, and it reminds me in the old days when people said that because of the ATM there would never be a branch bank. Well, there are lots of branch banks around the world. Uh, and there's always this hype cycle, and we're in that hype cycle now in technology. However, as I say that, there are massive implications for the nature of work that is being done. Uh, one of the things Michael alluded to this think tank that I started upon retirement called the Center for Global Enterprise, we've just commissioned a piece of work with MIT, uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, around the task associated with in, what, what individuals do. And which, what tasks do they do that are most likely to be enhanced or replaced by the technology? So we call it aug augmented or augmented intelligence, not artificial intelligence. 
Now, the good news and the preliminary results of the study that we've done with MIT, that if you're an economist, a lawyer, uh, a pundit of, any way, of anywhere in the world, your job is secure and safe. Uh, you don't have to worry about a machine replacing you. Uh, however, there are types of employment or jobs where there's repetitive tasks. And those repetitive tasks do lend themselves to the technology. Uh, for example, call centers and people in back offices of banks, they lend themselves to this technology that would be applied to a lot of their tasks that they do. However, though, if you're in any kind of professional expertise, your job will be enhanced and perhaps maybe the technology will replace the mundane and you can really do what you were trained to do, like practice law or medicine or what have you, versus fill in forms every day and apply for reimbursement from the government systems around the world. Uh, those sorts of things. So that's the nature of the work. Uh, at CGE, we're going to go deep in five industries, one being financial services, retail, logistics, mobility, and then healthcare, and do deep research uh, in those areas and come back with some recommendations and findings of what we see as a result of that analysis. However, in addition to the employee in your organization, the how they work and how you organize the work and how you manage the system is going to be also as different as what they do. And sometimes this is really misunderstood. And basically, I think the easiest way to think about it in today's world is look at how a startup in technology operates. And they're self-directed teams that move very, very quickly. They're almost horizontal in nature. And that the employees in that environment are empowered to have an impact. And they change constantly and they repurpose themselves constantly. Amazon's a great example of that. You can go through all the tech successful companies, Google, Facebook, in many ways, even the old fashioned ones like my old firm, this is how they structure and organize work in today's environment. But the people on those teams are also different than they were in the past. These people want to have an impact earlier. Of course, we all want to have an impact earlier, but they're frustrated. I mean, you know, our biggest goal, at least mine when I got out of school, is to pay off my student loans. I was a scholarship kid. I had to have a job. I, I mean, did I worry about whether I was going to change the world? No, I had debt, and my parents couldn't, weren't going to help me out, and so I had to get a job. So I started selling computers at IBM. And I did pay back my loans, I, for the record, you know, <laughs> for the record. <laughs> in today's world, you don't have to pay back your loans, but I pay back my loans. At least in the United States, you don't have to pay back your loans. Um, but there's anxiety amongst these younger people, whether they're millennials or Generation Z, et cetera. And there's great anxiety uh, in all the studies that we've done because they feel that the, our generation has left a world for them that's unacceptable. I mean, these, a lot of these people that are in these companies are referred to are not worried about not being able to compete and make a good living and all that, like other parts of society. This is like the world that they see is, uh, as, is without a lot of hope, a lot of negativism, and they don't see leadership evolving uh, in this world that'll do something about it. So you have this workforce uh, in today's environment that wants to be engaged, wants to make a contribution, wants a voice. Mike referred to Google, uh, and should they be part of national defense or not? Uh, the uh, founder and CEO of Facebook uh, was defending the First Amendment rights for his platform. 150 employees wrote him a letter telling him that was unacceptable, that he should not accept political ads on the platform. I mean, I mean, when I started at IBM, we had to wear dark suits, white shirts, military striped ties, wingtips, straw hats in the summer, wool hats in the winter. That's how much, we, how much say we had in the management system. Uh, needless, and that was only well 50 years ago or so. So it wasn't like it was 300 years ago, or the, you know, <laughs> the ice age or something like that. So this is the nature of the individuals, how they want to work, how they prefer their work, and they're totally connected on a global basis. Their attitudes are formed globally. They form feedback loops globally. It's not, you know, yes, they want a local environment that gives them safety, that's environmentally sound, et cetera, et cetera. But they and they understand the technology, but they they convene and align with their peers on a worldwide scale. So this fact, this this thing, well, you can control it within your little region of the world. Uh, I don't think that's going to work. Not not in today's world. I mean, you could balkanize the internet, but you can't shut it off. 
Uh, so you can censor it, but you can't turn it off. And they'll figure out ways around it anyway if you censor it. They're just too smart with the technology. The last one I would add about this, uh, they talked about the management system. It gets back to a lot of what we talked about for years is this learning. I mean, look, the term lifeline learning is overused. But the educational systems that were existed post-industrial age in this age of globalization aren't adequate for what's required for these future work individuals in the workforce. Educational systems have to dramatically change. They have to maybe be more agile, more quick, more fluid, more adaptive to what the needs are. Technology is moving too fast. So they, you know, you can't be teaching things in case studies that you studied 25 years ago and assume it's going to apply in today's world or to these individuals. It doesn't work, which is why we formed CGE when I retired from IBM because I had this, I mean, we worked with all the leading schools. But I formed this conclusion that the curriculum and how it was being offered is not preparing future leaders for the world, and that's a lot of what we do within CGE. The other thing we did as an example, and I don't want to talk too much about my old life at IBM, but uh, M Mayor Bloomberg uh, and myself uh, created these schools. There are like 200 of them in the world. Uh, a funny story, since Andrew set the, set the, I think, the high bar for humor, I can never compete. But, uh, but we were at the, uh, the U.S. Open tennis, uh, and there was a rain delay in between the finals and the matches. And, of course, Mayor Bloomberg and his uh, head of the school system, Joel Klein, were complaining about the unions and the schools and how they can't change or anything and all this sort of stuff. So I said, why don't we just start our own school? He goes, well, what do you mean? I said, we'll create our own school. Uh, we'll make it 9 through, uh, nine through uh, uh, 14. And when you get out of this school... Uh, you'll be prepared for a job in the technology industry. You'll get two degrees, a high school degree and an associate degree. You go on to college, four years of college if you like, get a, your bachelor's or your master's. And you're guaranteed a job at IBM uh, if you pass in that school and you pass our tests for $50,000 a year. Uh, and so Joel goes, you'll do that? He said, yeah, we'll give you the curriculum. And if you can't get the teachers in the New York City school system, we have a lot of people in IBM that are pretty good at STEM, you know, uh, and they'll, we'll, we'll staff it as well. Um, well, needless to say, Mike went out the next day and announced it on television, and that was the first one in Brooklyn, and there's 200 of them now around the world. Uh, and, but they're preparing people for what they need immediately in this segment to work in the tech industry. Now, I won't bore you with they broaden the schools into finance now. They're brought into aerospace, et cetera, et cetera, and, and also into biotech. But fundamentally, it really is its like the German system of apprenticeship applied to the tech world, which you can't say to the kids you're going to be an appren apprentice to be a carpenter or a bricklayer. You know, that would not be appealing to them, but they think this is pretty cool. Uh, and the kids, I mean, they're, they're incredible. They graduate with great, great grades, and they get into great schools if they want, and if not, they get a job. So... It's just an example of making the point that it's about how we are developing these young people in the world that they live in with the skills that they need that are constantly changing because the technology is constantly moving. So there's really like three simple points. One is jobs will be secure. They're just going to be different. They're going to be enhanced by the technology. I will argue they're going to be enriched by the technology but not displaced by the technology. People are going to will work and want to work differently and if you don't provide that to them, they'll find some place it does, whether it's here or someplace else in the world. They're totally mobile. Uh, and they, know they have these aspirations of what they want. They do want to change the world, but they want to live in a clean environment, in a safe environment, We have cultural experiences that are good for themselves and their families uh, for the long term. And therefore, if we don't adjust, there's going to be this continued, I would say, uh, dissatisfaction, therefore anxiety, or therefore lashing out, uh, that we see not only here, but you see many places around the world. So with that, thank you very much. And I think I pass it on to our leader, right? <laughs> yep. Sam, that's a terrific uh, way to get us started. I have a number of questions, but I'm going to hold them, and we're going to move on. Victor, take over. Okay. Uh, thanks, Mike. Uh, it's really great to, to be on this panel. Um, this is a subject that has been very dear to my heart, uh, but I'm just going to make two very quick comments in the interest of time and so on, so we can actually have a debate with uh, or, or interaction with all of you. Uh, the first is really to um, go back to what we were talking about this morning. 
at the beginning, <clears throat> which is the, the big, one of the biggest issues. Uh, the more I think about it, the more I think that's true, that, that we really have to address in the world is the whole concept of inclusive growth. I think, Mike, you said that that is probably the most important. And at the heart of that is jobs. It's really all about jobs. As I keep saying, you know, just side payments is not enough. You know, I think it's really about jobs, the nature of the jobs, nature of work. And to, to really build on what you were saying, Sam, I think I'd like to just make a couple points. If you look at the impact of the progress of technology now on jobs, the way I would kind of analyze it is very simple. It breaks down into two questions. The first question is, with this new brave world of technology, do you create more jobs than you destroy? You know, you, were, you, know, you, you absolutely make the right point. I am now, this debate went on for a while, do you create more jobs than you destroy? Just that, that issue. And I think that debate has pretty much been won. I think with the creativity that, uh, and the new services that are being de developed, I think it's pretty much the world has accepted. You can actually create more jobs than you destroy. So there could be a net increase in jobs. Now the problem now is the world's labor force, and in fact, longer term, the curriculum and how you teach people is over here. The jobs and the skill set that you need are over there. So that raises the second issue. Even if I concede the first debate that you do create more jobs than you destroy, how do you get the people from here to there? I think what the world really needs now is to focus on a total revolution in learning. You know, and that's the second part. I'm just building on what you were saying. You know, I mean, uh, how do you, I mean, we're talking about fr literally retraining and teaching billions of people. You're going to retread a billion people who are used to kind of doing this job and coming up the system and say, look at those wonderful jobs over there. Yeah, I, I love that, but um, how do I do it? So I, I think we really need to have a complete rethink of a, I, I use the word revolution. You know, one of my friends keep reminding me, you know, you know, what, what, you know, what, why is kindergarten called kindergarten? Now, if I'm not mistaken, the system K to 12, which is so pervasive in the world today, was invented by Bismarck right. in 1865 or whatever. <laughs> I, I don't know. And it was, it did a brilliant job of turning uh, country boys into the military industrial complex, be it as soldiers or in industry and so on. It's K to 12. Now let me ask you, you know, this is K to 12 in the US, K to 12 in Europe, K to 12 in China. It's the most pervasive thing, K to 12, right? Kindergarten, that's where it came from, German, Bismarck. Now, has the world changed since the days of uh, Count Bismarck? Why hasn't the system kept up with it? I think that is absolutely a revolution, and that comes to your point. I think we need to completely rethink something that's fit for purpose in terms of retraining and educating the future. And, and I think we've got to start getting away from this. Uh, and, and I think there's so much creativity that will be possible and necessary for us to deal with that. You know, one of the issues in this new environment that we have not really emphasized, I think, is that the speed of adjustment is completely changing the world right now. Whatever you do, you know, look at the government. Um, I think some one of the speakers, I, I forgot who said, you know, <clears throat> oh, I, I think, oh, no, uh, the vice chancellor said, you know, we, <laughs> this, these people here are reacting on a clock speed, right? Within minutes, they can go anywhere. But the university and the bureaucracy, you've got to call a meeting of this committee, that committee. It will take hours and days, you know. So are the systems that we have able to adjust to the clock speed that the world has today? So that means it calls into question whether our systems are fit for purpose. So for, the, for this particular issue, is our training and the learning fast enough to retrain people 
to, to get the new jobs as the new jobs are changing rapidly. And you've got to really minimize you know, this dislocation because it's the lag between, it's a structural unemployment issue. Otherwise, you know, it's going to be huge here. And these people are saying, yeah, I want to learn, but it takes me four years. So that, that uh, comes back to the final point on this, this thing. And, and your example is wonderful. The, the one you did with Mayor Bloomberg in New York between IBM, and that's a great experiment. But you know, the, 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 the real crux of that to me, I, there's so many innovations, is the participation of business in the whole thing. You know, we, ha we get this discrepancy between the output of the system. You know, even, even, even forget about our university, even the, the so-called, <coughs> you know, technical colleges, even those, the people that are trained are not necessarily the skills that the businesses need. What you guys have done, I think, in a very neat way is for the participation of business in setting the curriculum. And you basically say, look, if you allow me a hand in setting the curriculum, I'm going to employ this person when they go through the course. Now, that's a very different proposition for the guy going through the course. Now I go through, I, 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 I get my certificate. I don't know if I'm going to get a job or not. But IBM says, this is what I want the school to train you on. If you pass, I'm going to hire you. So the placement precedes the education. In fact, it doesn't cost money. It's just participation and the sequencing. You actually agree to hire these people before they go through the course. It's not that you guys train and then we'll see whether we can use them or not. That is going to be a huge issue. So I, I like to just emphasize the participation. Yeah, you can call it going back to the, um, you know, the, 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 the apprenticeship system that we see in Germany, et cetera. But, but I think this is the modern form of it. If we do that, I think there's going to be a lot faster, a lot more effective, and it doesn't cost more money. Because it's a matter of participation and getting a curriculum in place. So I think those are the thoughts that I just like to put on the table. And I think, the, to me, those, those are the issues that we really need to address collectively. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Victor. Um, yeah, that raises lots of interesting avenues to explore. So um, Rob, what, give us your thoughts on this. Uh, I want to start. You know, as an American, I was a little t taken aback at the last <laughs> panel uh, when we were talking about alphas, and <laughs> I thought I'd better not try to match my uh, bombastic Borneo bottom-up beta, <laughs> Andrew Sheng. But I will uh, reach to my gratitude for Victor and the work that you do. I've written a poem which I call the AGI Overcoming Fear Boogie. His name is Fung, and the songs he sung reaches out into the future. The man's alive, just watch him strive and embrace the contradictions. Climate tech, the world's a wreck, but he has such conviction. In Asia here, excuse me, in Asia here, he makes it clear we must ri rise above the mind's restrictions. <laughs> and that's a tradition. As you probably recall, a few years ago during the concluding panel with Stan Fisher and Mr. Wallenberg and so forth, I tried to create something. Uh, I just let the moment tell me what to, what to say, that uh, coupled with my affection for you. So I want to talk a little bit about this, uh, the place where I think we are and the challenge that we face. Um, I want to talk about scale and I want to talk about the breadth of the challenge. When the organization that I co-founded, INET, started, the last speech at the first conference was made by an Italian economy and finance minister, Tommaso Padiaschiopa. And he said, you will face three types of sustainability. Financial sustainability, which then in 2010 we were talking about vividly, Resource sustainability is on the horizon, and social sustainability. And he sat down next to me and he said, and it will all flow into social sustainability. I look now at the breadth 
of disruption. And I, I will foreshadow by saying that I think William Blake was right when he said the tigers of wrath are wiser than the horses of instruction. And what I mean is that we are being challenged to rethink how we construct our society now. Unfight, unbridled faith in the market, which was the aftermath of some failed experiment, experiments in the communist and social economies, and also perhaps the failed experience when religion and religious institutions became corrupted by the landed aristocracy at the time of Adam Smith. So we ran on a pretend structure that was devoid of values, had too much faith first in the state and planning and then not enough faith in anything except the market, and now the contradictions are before us. We have several types of disruption now that are very, very profound. Obviously, the fear of climate and the extermination of mankind sits on the horizon and the market unto itself. It may be a useful tool, but it will not take care of that alone in an unfettered way. Secondly, globalization. Victor, you, man you mentioned earlier and Mike has mentioned that the size and scale of development in Asia constitutes a huge transformation. If the island of Tonga had wanted to join the OECD, it wouldn't have been very disruptive. But when something five times the size of the United States becomes integrated, we're talking about a much bigger challenge and it's been playing out for 20 years and that's part of where the woundedness and the fear and the pain existing among people reside. And by the way, I will say this in my almost alpha American way, the people I most blame for that is the American leadership because the way in which we responded in the United States to globalization was to deregulate, cut public education and cut taxes for rich people and make it legal to keep their money offshore and pretend we can't afford it. And I think that is not something the Chinese had the power to change as they were pursuing development. Uh, but other things are very, very powerful right now. We're seeing a bit of it in Europe and the demographic profile of Africa pretends a very, very powerful, what I'll call induced disruption potential of migration. My closest friend in life uh, passed away almost a year ago. And what he said to me in the last six months of his life is you economists are finally going to get taught that people are more than just factors of production. Because when migration takes hold, you'll act differently than you would if they were like iron ore on a hot, on a rail, rail car bed. So globalization, climate are profound. Migration looms. And now we come to technology, which is the focus of this. And where I am concerned, and I would encourage you all, I'll, I'll leave it with you, Victor, to read Eric Fromm's discussion in the 1960s about universal basic income. Because what he essentially said, and I'll paraphrase, is you have this three, 400 years of tradition that your meaning in life is based on your work, your meaning in life is based on your contribution and your compensation is just. So I'm gonna be a facetious American again. So a bunch of Uber guys are kind of irritated because they want to have self-driving trucks, but they see it's gonna displace a whole lot of people from their job. So they invent something, reinvent something that Robert Theobald and others discussed in the 60s that's called universal basic income. And the first question I want to ask them is when your grandchildren with their trust funds are there and there's no more disruption to, to face resistance, are they going to persist with universal basic income? Will it be maintained at a level where it serves its social purpose? America, where I come from, is a little just too much of a tug of war about material conditions and I think it's extremely dangerous, extremely dangerous 
to try to change that psychology of 400 years, move people into a place where they, they, they have to redefine meaning and purpose in life, and you give them this support, and then you say, oh, we're going to take it away. We didn't mean it. If you think people are upset now, wait till, and, and, and they're here, scale matters. If once again, if we were talking to a few people outside of Detroit or Philadelphia or something, you can, you can manage that. The scope and scale of the innovation in technology and the transformation of work on planet Earth is enormous. If we're going to take on universal basic income, we, it's like that's a, that's a non-reversible decision for a very long time. Uh, I think I'm, I'm reminded, Mike, Mike and I had this discussion about two or three years ago. We were both in Switzerland at Davos, and Peter Goodman from the New York Times published a story called We Love the Robots. And what he said in that story was that essentially in Sweden, people trusted enough in each other in governance that you didn't have to save jobs because people were protected. And they could love the robots because they could re reach to what economists call the production possibility frontier, improving, and they could reap those gains. Leif Pogratsky, who a former technology minister of Sweden, a good friend of mine, ran the US consulate for Sweden. He brought a bunch of Swedish economists to a breakfast, and they said to me, the Institute for New Economic Thinking has to embrace a big challenge right now. The growth model was always set up that the Americans deregulate the supply side and everything then is more efficient, works better, and that's better than Europe, which is sclerotic. What we think is happening now is the breadth and scale of innovation is so large and so frightening that the American model will not work any longer. It will be swamped. And this was at, just after Donald Trump was elected. But the symptoms of fear and discord, and as I can't remember, one of the earlier panelists said, if you don't get it right in terms of the broad base of the population of fear and these nationalistic, what you might call, um, outgrowths <laughs> persist, these, these almost tumors of politics, we're not going to be in a place where we can save the potential of this system. So I think it's, it's very much, uh, I think, right that it's a terrifying time. Philosophers like Stephen Toulmin always wrote that you can see the fault lines as you move forward, but when the pain associated with those fault lines emerges, Everybody lurks back to the familiar. You go backwards rather than forward. It's time to go forward. William Blake says it best. The road of excess leads to the palace of wisdom. We're in a period of extreme excess in the misunderstanding and underestimating the nature of human beings embedded in a society and economy. And. Uh, the guy who said it best for our generation is sitting right next to me about 10 minutes before this panel. He leaned over and he said, you know, I don't know if I like Trump, but he sure is a gift because he's shaking us up and he's making us all think about where we got to go. <laughs> and that's where we are. <laughs> and maybe that's, that's an audacious American thought. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Rob. I have a couple of questions. What, Sam? You know, Fred, who has invested in a company and introduced me to an entrepreneur in China, is using artificial intelligence to, to really accurately detect skills gaps and learning capabilities and then apply technology to filling those things up, you know, or, or you know, solving the problem. And it, and, and the precision matters, right? Because it's not time wasted. This algorithm seemed to get it right. 
you know, this person has a weakness in this precise area in math or science or something like that. I guess, that, and so that puts me in mind, and I've heard this from other places, that is technology part of the solution to the speed problem as well as, uh, in some sense, the cause of the problem? What do you think? Uh, I think it is, and the reason I think it is is not because of the technology itself, which is can do exactly what Michael's alluded to. I think you need something outside the system to change the system. Uh, and I'll go back to my New York example. The frustration was the system was in, un, unable to generate a solution that trained people for the nature of work. And there were over a million students in the New York City school system, and between the bureaucracy, uh, the funding mechanisms of the state, teachers' unions, on and on and on, you couldn't get any change. So my pitch to the mayor and the head of the schools was, well, well, we'll make up our own system. There is no union for the system. If you can't get teachers, I'll give you the teachers. All you have to do is give me a building. We'll take it from there. Um, and we, we ask that we align with the academic institution because we have to train these teachers, you know. But did the kids care if they were certified or not? If you had your PhD in physics from IBM Research, did you care if you had your teacher certification from the state of New York? No, nah, probably not. You know, right? If you're a mathematician, did they? No, nah, probably not. So, uh, but my point being is that the only way I believe to change some of these entrenched bureaucratic systems, education is a good example, Mike, is you got to do it from outside uh, the system. Uh, I was involved in multiple transformations in my business career, and then the only way you can drive changes from the outside in. And a large bureaucracy, I mean, IBM is, I'll argue, a mid-sized bureaucracy. It's got, well, when I, when I left it, it was 410,000 people in 170 countries. So it was 100 years old. So you might say there's a bureaucracy in something that's 100 years old with 410,000 people of different cultures of the world. The only way to change it is from the outside in. You could not change it from the inside out. Now, uh, uh, the, the, it helps to be a native. I mean, it helped the fact that I was there uh, Lou Gerster came in, we had a problem. He used to say to me, Sam, you're the native with the map. I'm out there in a jungle. I have no idea how to get out of this jungle, you know, right? So you need that kind of orientation, understand to connect with the culture, but you have to change it from the outside in, which is why, in many ways, Silicon Valley has been so successful. I don't think they should call themselves disruptors in today's environment. I think they just open themselves up for criticism and government regulation. But nonetheless, what they have the incredible ability to do, and I work with all these guys, uh, especially now that I'm retired, is they can take our existing problem and flip it on its side. Well, your example of the my bank, you know, it's a, they just flip it on its side, you know, right? And what was my bank? It's an alternative to the entrenched system called a state-owned enterprise bank. It's the alternative. It flips it on its side. Why did the government allow it? I might argue because the government saw the need for change. If the government had not seen the need for change within the banking system, because you couldn't get credit to small business when I was working, and they used to meet with all the large banks, and they had no interest in lending money to small yeah. business, because their loans were guaranteed as a state-owned enterprise, why would you bother taking risk on small business? I mean, right? I mean, you, as we all know. So therefore, how did you drive change? Well, you used technology, but you used an alternative approach to the existing system. Uh, Donald Trump is certainly an alternative uh, view of the U.S. system. And actually, I said to Michael this morning, it only took about 90 minutes before somebody used the T word. In the U.S., in the US we, we pass the hat all the time. Will it take 10 minutes, 90 minutes, a half a day before somebody uses the T word? So in Hong Kong, you're right on the average at 90 minutes. <laughs> Did you want to? Well, yeah. No, go ahead. Mike, I well, Rob, you go ahead. I yeah. wanted to ask a question of, of yeah. the two other panelists here. Yeah. We, we, you've been involved in education, and I had an economist, Richard Baldwin, who's written a book called Globotics, come into my office recently, and he said his book is about the tour of what technical change has done in relation with humans over history. And his, his punchline was, we first replaced muscles, then we replaced brains. And my question for you is, if you're planning the curriculum for the next generation, if you teach them the STEM disciplines, you might be running right into machine learning. 
What do they have? What is it that we're going to teach them in this next dimension? I'll start and I'll pass yeah, it. No, you, having you, been sorry. having been through this before, would you need to take doctors for example? Uh, we we had this machine, this game called Jeopardy, United States. This thing called this Watson technology won and beat the grandmasters in the game. We were trying to ch get in the medical profession use these technologies to, to to enhance the doctors. What you had to do was you had to train in the medical schools. You had to train future physicians on how to use the technology, not know the technology, because there are a lot of people who can invent the technology. How do you use the technology? So I would start with, if I was uh, running a major school system anywhere in the world, I would start with the nature of the professions that you expect your graduates to perform. And some could be intellectual tasks, by the way, and there's massive amounts of research, as you guys know, online all the time. How do you use those tools? How do you mine those tools? But in the traditional sense of work, whatever discipline happened to be, I would be teaching them how do you use this tool set? No different than you taught them in the past, how you would use a slide rule or anything else when we were all in school, or calculate. Well, I'll, I was in school before they had calculators, and that's what anyway. <laughs> but now, you know, I'm, that's my point. Teach them how to use the tools. Teach them how to understand it, and then also, I'll add one other criteria to this, teach them the social responsibility of how you use those tools. Because you can use those tools for the good of society, and you can use those tools for the, obviously for the detriment of society. Mm -hmm. So you have to create also a social consciousness around the technology. And none of that's being taught today. Mm -hmm. Sam, I was also uh, brought up in the era of the slime rule. <laughs> <laughs> I used to wear my slime rule like this. Uh, proudly. MIT. Yeah, proudly. proudly. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I don't, you know, by the way, what Sam has done in CGE is something that we really benefited on uh, from, from Li and Fung to participate into looking at the types of work and answering the question in detail. But I'd like to say the following. I think I can go, we can go on for a long time about what type of skills, et cetera. But I think, frankly, it's uh, ability to react to the unknown is really what I think we're looking for. You know, I, I, other than just how to apply the tool set, I may be facing a problem in which I have no tools. I think that's really the the, the, the skill set. You know, um, I, you know, I, I you know, talking about training of civil servants. I was talking to um, Elwood, Dave, David, uh, the the dean of the uh, Kennedy School at that time. What was the single most important thing that you teach in your curriculum? You know what he said? Crisis management. Really? And this was more than ten years ago. And it's just the ability to react to the unknown and, and really be flexible, I think is really the key. But I, I want to just uh, raise another issue into this debate, if I may. Right. Um, you know, we, we're, we're focusing on work. We're focusing on jobs, how to make it more, more fit for purpose, mm, applicable. But I think in terms of the social responsibility side, I think we need to look at the amount of work available and how we allocate that work. And that really brings up the issue of what is work and what is leisure. You know, I, I, I think I've been in previous meetings and conferences, I asked, what's wrong with working two days and the five days of leisure? You know, I, I think in the days of our grandparents, uh, if you took one day off, they think this is crazy. I mean, you work seven days a week, right, from dawn to dusk. And now we work, uh, you know, we used to work five and a half days, right? Half days on Saturdays. Then we did away with that. So what's wrong with um, working for two days and having five days of leisure? Then the question is, what is leisure? Okay. And that way, actually, with the, with the allocation of work, it will be easier to, to have a more equitable distribution of work. But it's really, what is, what is leisure? Does leisure mean just going to the golf course? I don't think so. The leisure part may just mean that you're doing a different nature of work. I think you may want to spend two days actually making your, using the time to, 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 to earn enough to live on, let's say, for your economic benefit. You may actually think about another two days in which you do nature work, which is a contribution back to society and creating some public good. I think that's very meaningful work, and that actually contributes to the public good. And how do you def redefine 
uh, the difference between work and leisure may be the ultimate variable that we have to manipulate in order to get the balance and, 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 and the fair, I'm calling it fair allocation, fair distribution of work. Because I, I, I think it's going to be a, a very disruptive world and how we actually, uh, and then the final point, I'd like to react to what, what you just said. This, this concept of you know, universal basic income. You know, sometimes people used to think, oh, yeah, just a, just a safety net for people who are lazy that don't want to work. I, maybe you're introducing, you know, really a different principle, which is a safety net to allow people who are already very productive at the edge, having the, 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 the ability to take further risk, to actually keep pushing the edge out. You know, you know this, this idea, well, the, the, this, you know, we're talking about good technology, bad technology now all morning, and I totally agree. But does that mean that we want to slow down and reverse technology? We can't, first of all. And maybe you don't want to. But then you, you've got to actually then think about what you do and then having the ability to keep going forward and not putting yourself in jeopardy. So really, the, the universal basic income concept is not so much a safety net at the bottom, but a safety net at the, at the edge that will allow you to further develop the edge and do further experiments at the edge. So I, I think that, that may be the, the way that we should really be thinking about now. I, I was like other economists dismissed the whole idea of you know, just the, So it would, it would insulate well. other people from any adverse side effects yep. from your striving. Yes. So you could pursue that striving knowing you're not harming others. Uh, correct. Okay. And, 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 and also you, you're able to take risk you know, at, to yourself and also you, you have more time to sort out the good impact of technology and the bad impact of technology. Instead of saying, let's just stop technology because there are some Im bad impacts. You know, societies have done that previously. You know, the, the historian among us is Ji Wu. If I'm not mistaken, in the Ming Dynasty, you know, where they had a lot of technology when they, when they built huge ships and so on, um, there was a big debate in society and said, no, no, maybe we don't want too much technology. And I heard for a period of time, I don't know, this may be wrong information, Ji Wu, you're going to correct me. Um, they actually decided maybe we're much better off stopping the progress in technology, destroy the technology, and go back to a very calm, civilized community. Now, there's some I, people who think vis-a-vis -vis yeah, fossil right. fuels. That's a good <laughs> idea. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Well, but, but but what I'm trying to say is that I, I don't think that's an option. No. Not in today's environment with the global communication. But people could think that way. And maybe we need to enable them to think the other way, just keep on going forward, but in a meaningful way and a way that is sustainable. I, I, one observation and one question, and then we're going to turn it over to the audience. The observation is that people have said, so the mindset is technology marches on and humans have to adapt to it, uh, kind of. And so the question is, is that really the whole picture or does technology get developed that adapts to the sort of set of human capabilities? And uh, some of the questions we've talked about. My favorite example of democratizing access to digital technology is the graphical user interface. There was a time when we were young when you had to speak computer to make a computer do anything, Correct. and that's just gone. I think that the current generation has lived in the world of graphical user interfaces because that's what's on your your PC, it's what's on your phone, it's what's on your iPad, it's just everywhere now. Um, but somebody had to invent it. It isn't a permanent feature of the world. The question I want to ask you, to, just to reflect on briefly, is do we know, and I, but this we is kind of broadly, some people who study and research these things, do we know enough about, in the context of lifelong learning, what it is that helps people continue to learn. I mean, all of you have said in one form or another, the world's unpredictable. The skill set that you know you probably will need 15 years from now is not something we ought to take a wild guess at and then build systems for. So, so and, and all of you in one form or another have emphasized lifelong learning. So I, then the question I'm asking is, do we know what the inputs for young people are that make lifelong learning a either enjoyable, efficient, 
process, or is that something where we need a lot of work? I, I think there are some ingredients that people like Jim Heckman talk about at very early stages of life, from prenatal to age seven, kind of things you're expo increasingly not being exposed to iPad screens. Uh, and and the, there, there's now brain studies of arrested development associated with too much exposure to screens. Uh, but the types of nutrition and exposure to other people so that learning in the context of groups feels safe is something that inspires uh, I innovation. So there are a lot of different aspects before age seven. I don't know as much after that because INET's really worked on the early stuff. On the you. early stuff, okay. Well, I, Mike, I, you know, I just give a very straightforward answer. When, you, when people are in a certain pattern, you want to induce change. There's only two ways. One is fear, the other is incentive, right? I mean, sometime now I think we're driven mostly by fear <laughs> to lifelong learning because my job is going away. I think we need to change it to one of more incentive. And the way to do it is what you were just touching on, Rob, which is I think for you, if you expose people early in their life, early in their careers, to a variety of experiences. I think you've changed them permanently for life. Mm -hmm. Their curiosity, they're stimulated by incentive to learn, incentive to do more, incentive to see the world. So I, I think uh, I'm a great believer in, um, uh, you know, like, like our Asia Global Fellows, to be able to spend three months in Hong Kong. This is a major program for the AGI. Uh, and I think among the audience are all our Asian Global Fellows, to having spent this period in Hong Kong, I hope has permanently changed your outlook on life and your interest in the world and have stimulated your incentives to learn more. So when you do your lifetime learning, lifelong learning, I hope it's not stimulated by fear, but by the incentive. Good, very good. Um, I think we have a little time left. Um, so let's open it up. Does anybody, yes. Uh, this is a qu uh, question um, addressed to Sam first and then to the rest of the panel. Uh, thank you for, for the comments. Sam, I was really struck by the uh, experiment you talked about with the, the mayor, uh, you know, Mayor Bloomberg and the success. Um, as someone who studied both outside the U.S. and in the U.S., uh, one sort of um, thing that pops out is when you compare a three-year college degree, you know, in the U.K., at the end of which you're qualified to be a lawyer, versus the U.S., where you go to four years of college, maybe work, then go to grad school to be a qualified professional, that whole system seems ripe for a lot of change, okay? Should it take six years or seven years to be fully qualified? I'd be curious to get your views and that of the whole panel as to how that system is going to evolve to, um, you know, address uh, some of the issues that, um, uh, you know, Victor has raised. And obviously we can talk about the U.S., but some of it is a, a, a applicable to other parts of the world. Uh, well, that's a great question, but you know, in, in that system in the United States, the four years is 120 credits, roughly, if I'm not mistaken. No, it, it's 15, 30, yeah, it's 120 credits. Why is it 120 credits? I mean, Victor, was it Bismarck? I have no, I have no idea. We had to get 120 credits. You know, why was organic, why was organic chemistry five and English lit three? I can't tell you. I mean, one was easier than the other, I know that, having taken them both. The point of it is that we have these norms that are necessary, and that's what we learned with those schools. Um, you know, one of the things, because we actually gave the curriculum, it, it used this as a case study, to the mayor and the superintendent of the schools. Because they said, well, we're going to get, we'll, we'll give you the curriculum, and we'll give you the certifications and requirements and those sorts of things. For, the, for a segment of the industry called tech, you could do it for other areas. You know, it doesn't have to be that. Why can't you have these customized approaches? Why does it take 120 credits? Why do you have to work for two? I mean, I think if my kids all went to graduate school, it was good they worked for a while so they stopped drinking. At least they went to school to study. Because before that, all they did was play those, those beer, those drinking games, what are they called? I don't know, beer pong or something. There's some drinking game they all 
Beirut or something like that, right? I mean, so they had to get out the drinking games out of their system. But, but quite honestly, all it is is these, it's the model that is a legacy to the past that certainly we can't even explain why it exists, but it absolutely should be re-engineered based upon the profession you choose to pursue. So we're not saying you should go take STEM or whatever, in my case, take all this physics and math and all that stupid stuff. I mean, you know, I, like an idiot, I chose to do that. I was an athlete. I was paid to go to college. Why was I in these labs doing all these things? I was a misguided youth. Um, but, but seriously, I mean, I think my point being that is why can't we adjust the system to the desires of the individual and the needs of society and get rid of all these arbitrary definitions? Down at the back. Sorry. Yeah. Did excellent. Yeah. You need to stand up, please. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, this is Cecilia Milesi from Argentina, one of uh, Asia Global Fellows. It's really very um, inspiring to hear uh, how you, through your words, are bringing young people, marginalized people, to to this room. Uh, especially when outside they're kind of risking their life. Uh, so one thought is how we can make these uh, spaces more inclusive, how we can bring young leaders also to these spaces to discuss with us and women as much as people from other regions as ourselves. So this is one thought uh, for all of us perhaps to reflect. And my question to all of you is, can you more precisely uh, lead us by giving us, giving us one disruptive example of what we should do quickly in the business or in the policy making so we stop the chaos that we are seeing outside here, we are seeing Latin America and many other uh, spaces. So very precise uh, recommendation and disruptive ideas that we can take away with us to maybe implement in practice. Thank you. I'll start, and then I'll, but the, th and the authorities are to the left of me. <laughs> you know, we talk about these platforms of social media as a negative because of fake news. Why don't give these people a voice? Give them a voice. Apply the AI to their voice as to what they're really saying, what they need, and then adjust. Why can't political leadership listen to their constituencies, serve the citizens like they used to a couple hundred years ago, and adjust to be constructive. I mean, you could take all this stuff that we all complain about, call it fake news, and give them their outlet. Create a forum in Facebook where it's a, a, a free zone to express yourself, right? Unedited, and then use AI and analyze it because you're gonna have billions and billions of interactions. Look at the patterns and trends. Have somebody stand up and say, I'm gonna do that. Mike, can I, uh, yeah, go ahead, Rob. Rob. Yeah, the, at the Institute for New Economic Thinking, which is my organization, uh, I remember very early on, I met an education expert from Britain who lives in California. His name is Ken Robinson. And he said in his book, Out of Control, Everyone has an imagination, and creativity is an act of will. And one night I was at my daughter's preschool, and I met him through the headmistress of the school, and he asked me what I did, and he said, so your job is to reduce how much will it takes to be realized as creative. And my sense now is that one of the things that we've tried to do is Lots of young people who study economics, from undergraduates, even high school students, all the way through uh, postdocs, are very frustrated with the textbooks, with the curriculum, with what I'll call the taboos of what is not discussed. And we tried to create, we invested a great deal of money in creating a digital platform for them to form community all over the world. There are about 10,000 people now that are actively involved. They set up their own webinars. They set up their own things. They have convenings of 800 to 1,000 people. 
And I think when people start to feel a sense of community, when they feel heard, when they feel like people are trying to facilitate their engagement, that whatever the issue is, it, it becomes gratifying and more constructive. But it's, it's not, uh, I don't know enough about Hong Kong to know what outside, what the remedies would be. I think we better go to Victor for that. Well, um, you know, I, I think just to follow on on your point, I think what we really need today is to provide a inspiration to the youth so that they will have some hope for the future. What I think is not just Hong Kong, the whole world is what you guys have pointed to is they're really saying the social order, the, 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 the career path that you laid out for me, I, I, I don't believe in it. You know, I, I think that's going to be totally disrupted. Or I don't like the way that it has been. I, you got to give me something else, otherwise I, I'm, I'm frustrated. So this whole idea of how you actually inspire somebody to, to actually use their creative resources, to actually do something new, you got to, how do you remove all the barriers to unleashing creativity, I think is going to be one of the keys. And how the education system, Sam, has actually put a lot of barriers in the way. I think we need, well, that's why I use the word revolution. I think we need a whole revolution in the, in the education system, the way we learn and how we, and so on. And at the same time, I think we need to create um, inducements in the economy. I think almost every young person in this part of the world will say, I like to one day do my own business with technology and be a Jack Ma. Okay, their inspiration to be a Jack Ma, I think is something that we should give uh, some hope to. So how do we enable them and facilitate them to actually uh, take risks, do business startups, be exposed to the world, be curious, and to unleash their creative energies mm -hmm. and create hope for the future. Yeah. And then create then as a result upward social mobility, I think is really the long-term solution. Yeah, I just, we gotta wrap up, but let me, let me just say, I was very struck but you, there, you've got three leaders of important organizations. They move quickly inside, the, in the realm they work in, and when they see an opportunity, as the, in the case that Sam described, outside, right? Problem, solve it. And what, you, what they don't do is what you heard this morning. Oh, the government has meetings and moves slowly. Oh, academic institutions, you know, take a long time to change, right? So what I want to add to what, that you, what was just said is, and I think it's more in the business world, we have to change the mindset and not take these things as given because part of the answer is institutional change. You can't solve these problems just by creating, I mean, I agree with Sam. If you, you, know, if you have an embedded set of institutions that won't change, you have to attack them from the outside um, or you won't get the change. But I think there is, you know, we've got an awful lot of institutions. Uh, in America, we've got great higher education institutions, but the costs are going up faster than the healthcare costs, right? This is just completely, and it's not being disrupted, uh, at least not yet. So I think the other dimension of this is reject the, the constraints that we've all taken as given for a long time and move forward. Please join me in thanking the panel for a really interesting discussion. Yeah.